All right, well, we'll get started now. Um, first, a, a bit of housekeeping. This is our, our fifth webinar, so welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, our next webinar will be June 14th, and the topic for that is Seed Saving for Beginners. It'll also be at 7 o'clock Central Time. Um, and our Education Assistant Grant Olson will be covering the ins and outs of beginning seed saving, especially for crops like uh, tomatoes and beans and lettuce. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Um, this talk is going to be about understanding open pollinated hybrid and heirloom varieties, kind of how they're made, um, examples of, of projects that people are doing working with each of these seed types. Um, so we will be taking questions after after we discuss each of um, the varieties. So after the open pollinated, we'll take questions and so on. Um, my name's Shannon Carmody, and I'm the, the public programs manager here at Seed Savers Exchange. So uh, let's get started. Um, the first variety we're going to talk about are the open pollinated varieties. Um, for seed saving purposes, the most significant distinction among all these types, hybrids, OPs, and um, heirlooms, is that gardeners can save true to type seed from open pollinated and heirloom varieties, but not hybrids. And we'll get into that. Um, open pollination is when pollination occurs by insect, bird, wind, human, or other natural mechanism, but there is no restriction on the flow of pollen between individuals. Open pollinated plants are more genetically diverse. This can cause uh, more variation within plant populations, which allows plants to slowly adapt to local growing and climate conditions year to year. And this is, of course, what we love about open pollinated uh, varieties, but that variation might be something that farmers looking for a very uniform crop um, might not like as much. Um, as long as pollen is not shared between different varieties within the same species, so if you have two different tomatoes in your garden, they're not crossing, um, then the seed will remain true to type year after year after year. So what you save um, is, is what you will have the following year. The result of open pollination is that every plant grown from the, the saved seed is unique. However, all the plants share some certain characteristic that is desirable to, to you, the gardener, or to the farmer growing them. So you, you end up with a lot more diversity with open pollinated. Um, open pollinated, or OPs as people call them, um, are, are currently being created by breeders and seed savers, um, and they do it for a lot of different reasons. They might be trying to destabilize a hybrid, or excuse me, stabilize a hybrid, um, meaning take a hybrid and make it into an OP. Um, and they're also trying to select varieties that are suited well for the region. As I mentioned, because they can grow and change and adapt, some OPs are going to work better in the Pacific Northwest than, say, um, in the hot uh, summers of the Southeast. Um, others are developing the heirlooms of tomorrow, or this would be kind of the category of people doing the breeding work um, for future generations, much like we appreciate the breeders who have given us the diversity of seeds and heirlooms that we have today. So I'd like to highlight a couple of different OP breeding projects. Um, and one way to do this is to talk about the Organic Seed Alliance. Much like Seed Savers Exchange encourages members and gardeners to save their own seed, or the Organic Seed Alliance, or OSA, trains farmers in basic on-farm seed saving, crop improvement, and plant breeding practices. They do this because they recognize the seed knowledge is being lost even more quickly than uh, genetic diversity. So according to their website, they work with farmers through the Heirlooms of Tomorrow program to breed new varieties and restore older varieties for the needs of organic farming and gardening. Um, these are varieties that do well uh, with, without inputs or synthetic inputs, and they have broad genetic adaptability um, that allows them to be, again, selected for a certain region. And much like our heirlooms, they will stand up over the time and thrive under organic conditions and be passed down from farmers and gardeners to become the heirlooms of tomorrow. So here's an example of a charred variety uh, called Supreme Red. Oh. I'll go, come back to that slide. So there's, there is the Rhubarb Supreme Red, and this is being developed, or rather worked on, by John Navazio, um, the senior scientist at OSA. Um, and this is, this is Navazio here. He also works with carrots and um, his quote here kind of ties back to that idea of keeping a lot of diversity and a lot of genetics in our OP varieties. 
Uh, and as a side note, he is one of the keynote speakers for our conference this summer. I, sorry I had to put that in there. So back to the red supreme uh, rhubarb chard. Um, Navazio describes this as an old standby for many gardeners and farmers. It was first offered by Burpee in 1941, a selection that their breeders made out of crimson giant Swiss chard. Unfortunately, many older open pollinated varieties get less and less attention from seed companies because they're not as profitable as hybrids. In his years as a farmer, um, John noticed that commercial plants were going downhill. It was losing its vibrant color, it was increasing in disease susceptibility, and being more and more prone to bolting. So he set out to restore it and then take it one step further um, and improve it by increasing disease resistance. Now it has a deep, darker, more consistent red color, um, no, no more white or pink striping, and it's also a little more resistant to bolting. The next person I'd like to discuss is um, Craig LaHoulier. He's a longtime SSC member, and he's actually our tomato advisor. He is also known, especially around Raleigh, North Carolina, as the NC Tomato Man, or the North Carolina Tomato Man. Craig and his wife um, had been selling tomato seedlings at the farmer's market for years and was frequently asked um, for about all the delicious, unusual, um, open-pollinated varieties that he liked to grow, and heirloom varieties that he liked to grow. He was asked, you know, did these plants do well on our, our decks in pots or on our, in our apartments in a window? And of course, um, his customers loved the big fruit and the different colored heirlooms. The tall vines that they grew on proved to be a quite, quite a challenge for them. So Craig, along with a huge team of volunteers, um, is working on a, a dwarf tomato project where they're breeding dwarf varieties exactly for um, city dwellers and people without a lot of space to grow um, these great diverse varieties. So dwarf varieties pri prior to this project uh, were relatively rare and unknown. Um, the yields of dwarfs will never approach that of kind of the varieties that you would grow in your garden, but they do let people experience the diversity of those delicious, unique uh, heirloom OPs. Uh, Craig explains, what we are producing in this project is a color, size, and shape range that will allow those who are space constrained to experience the nature of many of the well-known heirloom types, but in a growth habit that is much easier to manage. He adds, we hope to have created a set of non-hybrid varieties that will make gardening interesting for you, as well as provide what will be considered valuable heirloom varieties at some point in the distant future. So you can certainly see um, Craig, as, as well as John Navazio, are definitely thinking about for future generations when they're breeding their varieties today. Um, in this photo, you can see uh, Craig's driveway, and I believe all the tomatoes in the white bags are the dwarf varieties. Uh, the next group I'm going to talk about is the Adaptive Seed Company, and they are also Seed Savers Exchange members, enlisted members, so they share and exchange seed in our yearbook every year. Um, and most of the seed that they sell is adapted to the Pacific Northwest. So again, they're really um, embodying the, the adaptability and the diversity of the open pollinated varieties. What's unique about this company and, adapt and them is that they offer varieties that have, have a huge amount of genetic variation in them. And this way, gardeners can select and save seed from the varieties and eventually end up with a variety that works best in their garden. Um, uh, looking on their website, one of the varieties of kale they have is called the Extremist Agreements, and they describe it as a crossed-up, diverse gene pool mix of all of these different kinds, Red Ursa, White Russian, Dwarf Siberian, and Delaware. And they we, we took a tip from plant breeders and have taken all the extreme kales and put them in a room together in order to see what kind of agreements they came up with. So they also added, it seems they came to some pretty centrist agreements as there is not much radical diversity in this line as we expected. But they did say there are some, a few new and exciting rearrangements of traits and everything is tasty and hearty to a cooler climate. Um, on their website they write that they're not a typical seed company um, and if they're doing their job well, sooner or later everyone's going to save their seed and uh, put them out of business and that's how they prefer it. Creating hybrid varieties happens through a controlled method of pollination um, in which the pollen of two different species or varieties, um, in, in the case of most of the crops it's mostly uh, varieties, is crossed by human intervention. Hybridization can occur naturally through random crosses, but commercially available hybridized seed, often labeled as F1, is deliberately created for a desired trait. 
So <clears throat> here's kind of our, our simplified version of this, just to give you a general idea before we get into details. So you have this huge, red, delicious, juicy tomato, um, and you, you really love the size of it and, and how meaty it is, um, but you, you just hate the color red. So you have this small yellow one that you really like the color, but it just doesn't have that same meaty quality that the red one does. So through years and years of, of practice, you somehow combine them, and voila, you have your yellow tomato that's nice and big and juicy. So that is such a simplified version of it, um, but we'll get down to the details here. So understanding hybrid varieties requires a little background on genetics. Um, G. H. Scholl, a geneticist at Cold Spring Harbor, New York, observed hybrid vigor. Um, this is a phenomenon that there's an improved quality in hybrid offspring. And I'll get into this a little more. He started these experiments in 1906 on inheritance in corn. And he observed how corn lost vigor when it became inbred, but then it regained it when it was crossed with another variety. So here's how it works. And let's take corn as our example. Um, the production of corn, uh, of hybrid seed, require, requires careful control of the parents. Um, first, inbred lines must be developed. So, inbreeding involves moving pollen from an individual plant to the silks of the same plant, um, or by covering the silks and tassels with bags and transferring the pollen from the tassels to the silks by hand. Um, and maybe you've heard of stories of teenagers having summer jobs detasseling corn. This is probably something they were doing. Um, in this picture, we are hand pollinating corn, but we're not creating inbreds. Inbreds mean you're taking the pollen from one plant, putting it on that same plant so that the, the gene pool is um, getting smaller and smaller. So hybrid, um, so when a plant from an open pollinated variety is self-pollinated, like I said, the pollen goes on to the, ta the silks of the same exact plant, the offspring will resemble that plant, although there will be some variation. If you do that again, there, again, there's going to be a little bit of variation, but to a lesser extent. Um, if this process is repeated many times, then the plant will become inbred, and an inbred is produced. And this means that an inbred self is self-pollinated, and all of the, the progeny, or the offspring, will be genetically identical to each of the inbred parent. But as I mentioned, um, inbred corn lost vigor. So what has to happen is you have to cross two different inbreds to then increase the vigor again. Um, and then, so hybrid seed comes from that cross of the selected inbred parents. So hybrid seed is planted to produce a crop that is harvested for, you, for use. Um, this might not be the same with your OPs because you can both harvest it for eating and then harvest it for seed as well. Um, seed saving from the crop and from this corn crop, for example, or any hybrid, is undesirable because the two different versions of the genes in that F1 hybrid will segregate out. So in our example of that red big tomato and that little yellow tomato combining um, to, tr to make the, the big yellow tomato, that if you save seed from that variety, you get some sort of mix-up of all of those genes in the third generation then. Um, in other words, all of the good qualities from that first hybrid disappear with second plantings, and so on. Um, although you can make that an open pollinated variety by then selecting out the, for those traits that you found desirable in the first place. This takes many, many years. Um, the hybrid is obtained... Oops. Um... The hybrid is obtained by crossing the inbred lines, which therefore have to be separated and maintained. So this is really hard for farmers to do on their own farm, which means that seed companies are, are the people that um, produce hybrid seeds, and, and farmers have to buy from those companies every year. But there are interesting projects happening with hybrids for the home gardener. Um, many are, are bred for specific disease resistance, like tomatoes with late blight resistance, which can be detrimental in your garden, um, melons less susceptible to powdery mildew, or cabbages that are resistant to fusarium yellows. Um, you can, this is a, an example of uh, a famed great breeder named El Elmer Swenson, and he donated his uh, grape collection to us, and he bred northern hardy grapes. 
uh, where Seed Savers is in northern Iowa, where it's zone four, and it's really cold. And he um, managed to get some table grapes up here by crossing them um, with V. riparia, which is a, a northern native grape. And then he, he crossed that with a European grape. So there's a picture of Elmer doing that there. And there's a picture of Elmer Swenson with, with some of his grapes. He was a self-taught uh, grape breeder and a, a good example of how amateurs have really always been a part of the seed movement and um, selecting and growing varieties. This is kind of a fun, another fun example out there. Um, I don't know how many of you are seed catalog um, fanatics in January when they all come to your mailbox. Um, and if you get the Johnny selected seed, you probably notice the flower sprouts, which is a cross between Brussels sprouts and kale. Um, they describe it like this on their website. Unlike Brussels sprouts, flower spout sprouts remain open and resemble attractive, colorful flowers. They grow on tall, upright plants, just like Brussels sprouts. The tender, mildly flavored sprouts have an excellent E quality and are suitable for sales to high-end restaurants and specialty markets. They are excellently light steamed or sauteed. Uh, one marketing suggestion is to sell them in clamshells. Not quite as cold hardy um, as Brussels sprouts or kale. So with all of that, um, why do hybrids get a bad rap often? Um, and that is because more often than not, they're bred for less tasty or novel traits like shippability and uniform production. And, you know, as a gardener, there's so many different hybrids you can choose from. But as an eater or someone goes to the store, um, you know, this shippability and uniform production is especially true of the vegetables we buy in the grocery store. We get a little more diversity as gardeners. Um, and also the adaptability we discussed with OPs does not exist with hybrids. The same early girl tomato that was offered by Burpee in 1975 is still genetically identical to the one you might buy today. Um, or you can picture a seedless watermelon. Um, you know, that seed obviously isn't adapting to anything. Um, and, and so the big question and the most important question is where does that leave us? And more importantly, where does that leave future generations uh, when we are looking for varieties that are better suited for uh, a changing environment, changing climates? different pests and that sort of thing. Um, so we'll move on to what I can speak m best about, and that is heirlooms, because that is, of course, what we do at Heritage Farm. So it's all going to get better from here. Um, an heirloom variety, well, let's get to our heirlooms here. An heirloom variety is a plant that has a history of being passed down within a family or community, similar to the general generational sharing of heirloom jewelry or furniture. An heirloom variety must be open pollinated, but not all open pollinated plants are heirlooms. So if an open pollinated variety doesn't have a history, um, then it's not considered an heirloom. Um, some companies create heirloom labels based on dates. So they'll say if a variety is 50 years old, um, it's an heirloom. We identify heirlooms by verifying and documenting the generational history of preserving and passing on seeds. So it's not really um, as clear as just saying... Um, that it's been around a certain amount of time. So we divide heirlooms into two main categories. Family heirlooms, or these varieties that have a history of being saved within a family, and historical heirlooms, or varieties that were once commercial, but, um, but now are maintained by a family. They Maybe they were dropped from the catalogs and somebody really liked the variety so they kept it going. I'm going to explain the historical heirlooms by telling the story of Fearing Burr. Um, Fearing Burr was born in 1815 in Hingham, Massachusetts. He was a seeds man and a, a Boston-based merchant, and he was a prominent figure in 1850s horticultural happenings. Um, and at that time, New England was transitioning from, Euro from getting seed from European seed companies to domestic seed companies. Um, and this process resulted in a lot of varietal confusion and inconsistency among vegetable producers. So, in 1863, Burr published Field and Garden Vegetables of America, which is the cover you see there on the right. Um, as, and this was the first comprehensive catalog of popular American vegetable varieties. He described nearly 1,100 varieties. Um, here's kind of just some snippets from the pages in his book and the line drawings of the different varieties. He wrote that it was designed as a manual to assist in the selection of varieties rather than as a treatise on cultivation. 
And the book provides descriptions of diverse collections of vegetables grown in the U.S. He references their different size, form, color, quality, and season of perfection, their hardiness, productiveness, and comparative value for cult cultivation. During Burr's time, this work served a critical role in reducing redundancy in varietal listings, and it also distinguished unique varieties. Um, but today, for SSE, Burr's account lets us understand the history of our varieties and compare how those varieties perform today, um, nearly 150 years later. Um, and many of these varieties um, were offered at one point, you know, nearly 150 years ago commercially um, and are not around commercially anymore, but were maintained by a family. So that's how we define those historical varieties. Um, I'll highlight just a few of them. We grew um, a number of them in a display garden here last year, and these are the ones that stood out. Um, there's a lettuce called the Brown Dutch Winter, and it was described as with a head of medium size, rather long and loose, the leaves which coil or roll back a little on the borders about the top of the head are yellowish green, washed or stained with brownish red. The surplus leaves are large, round, waved, green washed with bronze red. Seems best adapted to winter or very early culture. Here's another variety. This was a um, picture was taken a little later in this season, but these were really neat. They're called pixie cabbages and um, really small, compact, nice cabbages. Um, it's a recent sort, remarkable for its earliness and generally dwarfish character. The whole plant, when full grown, is scarcely larger than a colwort. No idea what a colwort is, though. Um, or some varieties of cabbage lettuce. It is a tender texture, the flavor is mild and delicate, and as an early variety, it is recommended for cultivation. And it is still that way today, certainly. Um, and now we'll talk about family heirlooms, and this is definitely how um, the general classification of heirlooms um, is in kind of popular use of the word heirloom. Um, and the next couple seeds I'm going to talk about are projects that are seeds that have come about um, because they've been in our collection at Heritage Farm, but also they've kind of come back to the forefront because we started a project called the Collection Origins Research Effort, um, also known as the CORE Project. I'll refer to it as that. And um, this is our way of kind of going back into the collection to consolidate and verify and enhance information that we know about each variety. We want to be able to tell the stories of our seed um, and trace them back as far as we can. Um, we have many thousands of varieties in the Seed Savers Exchange collection, and so this effort's certainly going to take a while. Um, many varieties do have good histories already, um, and, and some are more mysterious than others. Um, but the core project manifests itself in a number of ways. Uh, we often go through archives of our old letters, um, and seed letters can be written on letters, or in this example, um, people just sent their seed and then wrote the letter on the back of a um, paper bag, and you know we have boxes of these sorts of things here. This is a particularly funny one where somebody wrote their seed letter on the masking tape um, that they used to package their seeds in when they sent it directly to us. Um, if we don't have a lead or, or a seed letter, we'll try and call up the original donors, um, and more often than not, we end up tracking down their descendants or, or their old neighbors in some cases. And those descendants will help dig up old photos or garden journals. Um, and so it seems that each time we pick a variety to investigate, it kind of steps up and say, okay, now it's time to tell my seed story. Um, and they, they do have quite interesting stories. So I will tell you a few of them. Um, we'll start with the Phoebe Vincent Lima Veen. Um, but just to give you a little background, because you'll be seeing some of these images. Um, these are our evaluated, evaluation scans, and we use these to detect any changes that might have occurred um, during different regenerations. Um, so if we grow it one year, and then we grow it ten years later, we can look back and see if there was any change that happened as a possible result of cross-pollination. Also, it's just a way to document the collection, so if somebody calls us and asks us about a variety, we have information to give them. Um, so, back on to, to the Phoebe Vincent heirloom. In 1987, Seed Savers Exchange received a letter and a seed donation uh, from Mrs. Phoebe Vincent of Waverly, Nebraska. She wrote, 
Dear Sirs, I am sending some of my brown lima beans that are descended from some my mother used to raise and gave me seed when I married and left home. I have raised them some years, but not every year, as the family seems to prefer other kind. I have found that they outbear the white lim limas I have. As my family do not raise their beans and such, I hate to see them lapse away. I am 87 years old, 88 July 2nd, so I can't expect too many more years. My mother came from a German mixed with French family. I do not know if the beans came from there, but Mama was careful to raise them. Respectfully, Phoebe Vinson. So this was all we knew about the variety. Um, and unfortunately, even though it's a good letter with an excellent story, it doesn't say um, any dates that could tell us how old this, this seed actually was. Um, so our seed historian, um, that's actually a, a position we have here. It's the most coveted job at Seed Savers. Um, she reviewed this original letter and began investigating possible ways to contact Mrs. Vinson. Um, and she soon learned that she had passed away and was able to find a grave site uh, of her, a picture of a grave site on a genealogical website. And she attempted to initiate contact through that genealogical organization. And then eventually the seat historian was put into contact with Phoebe Vinson's great granddaughter, Jennifer who put our seed historian in contact with Phoebe's granddaughter, Sandra. Uh, Sandra told Sa Sarah, our seed historian, I remember Grandma telling you about sending the seeds to be preserved. Grandma was a thrifty person and always saved seeds to replant the following year. Sandra shared childhood memories, including her grandmother's large vegetable garden and practices of organic gardening and crop rotation. Sandra said she always had vegetables and fruits, especially strawberries and black raspberries. Year, year round. Vegetables weren't something she bought at the grocery store. One significant piece of information that we were able to find out through this was that Phoebe's, or Sandra, Sandra's grandparents, um, and Phoebe were married in 1919. So we know that um, Phoebe had gotten these seeds from her mother in 1919, allowing us to know that they were at least that old, um, if not much older. The, the next variety is known as Simpson okra, um, and Simpson okra was described in our yearbook, which is our annual seed exchange, as a very good heirloom of Mrs. Norris Simpson, Rogersville, Tennessee, and that was, um, that was it. That was all we knew about it. It was listed by uh, Dr. James A. Wolf of Rogersville, Tennessee, and uh, he listed it every year in the yearbook from between 1994 and 2010, and he donated it to the SSE collection in 2001. Um, Dr. Wolf passed away in 2011, and that was all the information we had. Um, so we, we tried to contact other listed members who had, uh, or other members in the yearbook exchange that had shared this variety, but they didn't know anything else as well. So one of our staff members started researching this variety by attempting to contact Nora Simpson in Rogersville, Tennessee, which meant looking up uh, Simpson in the Rogersville, Tennessee uh, phone book. So um, he called Bert Simpson, then he called Benny Simpson and Betty Simpson, and the list went on and on, and he had no luck finding anybody who was related to a Nora Simpson. So this story kind of, um, or this seed kind of went on the shelf, and then one day, uh, and another, our, our worker here received a call from a recently widowed woman named uh, Phyllis Wolf. And Phyllis Wolf was the widow of James Wolf, the man who had donated the seed. She had called to ask for advice on what to do with her husband James's huge seed collection that was living in a large freezer chest, uh, which is a whole different story. But um, Erin, our staff member here, was aware that she would be the person to know about the Simpson okra. So he asked her, and she said, of course, Nora Simpson was my neighbor. And Nora Simpson had died in 1976, Phyllis said. Um, Phyllis said her husband James had many seeds saved by Nora Simpson and other neighbors in their community. Um, so Phyllis put Erin into touch with Nora Simpson's daughter. Um, her name was D.V., and that was a name that, they could not, that had not come up under Simpson in the phone book because she didn't have a phone. So Erin sent her a letter with some questions about the Simpson okra, um, and we were able to find out quite a bit more about that variety than just knowing that it had come from Nora. Erin um, asked D.V., how are the pods typically used? 
breaded and fried, used in vegetable soup, cooked with tomatoes, and any other recipe using okra. Aaron asked, is, the, is this a family heirloom? This is the only okra my family has grown since I can remember. When did your mother first grow the variety? I can remember my mother, Nora, growing this in the early 40s. When and from whom did your mother obtain the seed? I have no idea where she obtained that seed. In what year did you begin growing the variety, and how did you receive it from your mother? I started growing the garden in 1954 after she became disabled. I used all the variety she had saved, including that okra. About how many days does it take for the plant to produce mature fruit? I have never timed it, but I believe 60 to 70 days. DV described the okra as sturdy, growing four to five feet tall. The pot is green and grows six to seven inches long and is very tender when picked every other day. Erin asked if, DD, if DV had any photos of Nora, the okra, or herself, but she had never owned a camera and didn't have a picture of herself. Um, furthermore, her sister, Rosella, did not like being in photos. Um, Seed Savers is grateful to Dr. Wolf for his donation and to Phyllis and, and DV for deepening our under, understanding of this wonderful heirloom variety. This next variety is called is our collar number four in the collection, known as Old Timey Blue. Um, the letter that we received with this variety read, I was, I was reared on a farm in the sand hills of Fayette County, Alabama. I am of Cherokee Indian ancestry, and as long as I can remember, my relatives grew these blue collards in their gardens. I am 65 years old, so these plants date back 100 years or more before me. As a child, I remember they were called old-timey blue collards. Ralph Blackwell of Jasper, Alabama, wrote this in his donation letter in 1989. Ralph Blackwell passed away in 2009, but our seed historian was able to contact his brother, Barry Blackwell, who, was, who claimed that he had given the seed to Ralph in the first place. So I think he was glad to be able to clear the air, finally, after all these years. Um, he had also been growing the seed for nearly 35 years himself. Barry received the seed from his Aunt Isla. He doesn't know exactly how long his family had been growing the collard, but it had been passed down through his father's family. He can remember his mother growing it when he was a boy in the 1930s. The Blackwell family typically plants old-timey blue in the fall and says the plants sweeten up after frost. Barry and Ralph's mother would make a kraut out of the leaves when he was a kid. Dark blue greens have smooth, thick blades and purple stems. Leaves get up to 14 inches long and 8 inches wide. So that concludes the storytelling part of our heirloom varieties. Um, and as I mentioned, there are thousands of varieties in our collection, and each one of those um, you know, has the potential to have such a, a long um, and important history to so many individual people. Um, and so when you, know, you talk about the different heirlooms and OPs and, and hybrids, there are so many wonderful different seeds to choose from. Um, but what's really unique and what's really important is that those OPs and these, these heirlooms um, are always being developed and will always be something that um, will be able to be there for future generations. And certainly there are lots of fun hybrids out there too, so we don't want to give them a total bad rap, but um, the adaptability and the, the sharing that can go on after generation of generation really is an important aspect of hybrids and OPs. Thanks everybody for tuning in.